morning. Will you pray with me? Father, we invite your spirit to be with us now. Empower my speech. Empower our ears to hear and to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. One of my favorite hymns that I grew up with, and one that we still sing quite frequently in chapel, is this hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. But I confess that when I sing this song, there's always a sense in which I sing, please God, let this be true of me. In other words, when I sing, it is well with my soul, I feel humbled. I feel very small, knowing that I am going to need God's grace and his empowerment, indeed, to suffer and to suffer well and to endure. So it's not too difficult to say it is well with my soul when we're feeling things are good in our lives. But it can be quite challenging to continue to sing it is well with my soul when we are undergoing tests to our faith, challenges to our faith in body and in soul. In the passage we're going to examine this morning, I think James has his eye on two of the greatest threats to our endurance. The main threat that I'm going to focus on this morning that I think James has his eye on is that of deep bodily illness, weakness, and suffering. Will we endure amidst our, in our faith even when our bodies and our minds or the bodies of our loved ones and fellow believers experience decay and great pain and suffering, or will we fold? The primary focus of James in our passage this morning seems to be exactly upon this theme. What do we do when we encounter challenges to our faith? When a loved one is diagnosed with illness, when an aging family member starts to show signs of decay and dementia in mind, when our own bodies experience remarkable pain and weakness and suffering and diminishment of spirit, in those painful and challenging situations, what will we do? Will we direct our speech to God in prayer? Or will we turn inward and away from God? When peace like a river attendeth my way, it's maybe not too difficult to say it is well with my soul. But when sorrows like sea billows roll and when trials come our way, it can be quite challenging to turn our direction to God and to believe that he is good, powerful, and present even amidst our pain, our suffering, and our weakness. All of us, I believe, have experienced and will continue to experience these kinds of threats to our belief that God is indeed good, powerful, and present among us, even in our sufferings and our weaknesses. We've already seen that James has shown us how God uses our sufferings to produce endurance so that we'll be able to be whole and complete people. We've seen that God promises to give to us the crown of life to those who endure in faithfulness to God amidst our sufferings. And today, we will see that James calls us to direct our speech to God in prayer for healing amidst our sufferings and our weaknesses. Now, there are a variety of commentators who look at the ending of James, James 5, 12 through 20 or so, portion of which we read this morning, and say that it's something along the lines of a string of unrelated exhortations with no clearly obvious flow to it. Obvious flow to it. And I will admit, the logic behind some of these exhortations is challenging. But I don't think it takes a Bible scholar to be able to see that in our text, prayer to God is emphasized at every point as the exhortation that we're given. And the prayers that we're exhorted to offer are given within a context where we are experiencing real threats and challenges to our endurance, to our ability to basically continue in our faith in God. Look again, I'll go through this briefly, but look again at James 5. And notice here both the exhortation to pray amidst then the challenge to our faith. Verse 13, if any among you is suffering or is weak, let him or let that one pray. Verse 14, is any one among you weak? Call for the elders and they will pray. Verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Verse 16, pray for one another so that you may be healed. And in verses 17 through 18, two references to Elijah as one who prayed earnestly to God. Prayer is the obvious command, the exhortation, 
and the situation is primarily one of illness or severe bodily suffering, along with, as we'll see in a minute, continuing sin. But why does James exhort us to pray? What is the logic of prayer? What are we doing when we direct our speech to God in prayer when we encounter these real threats to our endurance in the faith? I want to offer to you the suggestion that James gives to us three reasons why we are to pray to God when we encounter weakness, illness, and bodily suffering. First, we pray for the suffering, that's we pray for the suffering, as a tangible act of embracing the weak and the sick. One of the devastating aspects of human weakness and illness consists in how this situation can so easily lead to exclusion from human touch. Literal human touch and the communal enjoyment of friendship and relationships. You've probably noticed that the world we live in responds to human suffering. It responds to weakness, often by removing those who are sick or weak from society by isolating those who suffer in body from those who do not suffer. Of course, sometimes this may be necessary uh, as a means of receiving medical treatment. But one consequence is often that those who are sick uh, are placed in institutions. Institutions are created, in other words, that can have the effect of isolating the weak and the sick and the vulnerable. Hospitals, nursing homes, institutions for the mentally ill, homes or institutions for those with physical disabilities. All of these institutions can have the effect of alienating, of, of, of basically producing social alienation for the one who suffers. And so the one who is weak or is sick may find themselves uh, to be isolated from others and may even find that there's a fear or a stigma attached to them because of their weakness, because of their illness, or because of their age. And the so-called normal people find that then they feel perhaps uncomfortable or nervous or maybe afraid to be with those who suffer. James envisions something different in this text. Note that language again in verse 14. Is there anyone who is weak among you? The one with weakness or sickness, in other words, it appears, has not been excluded from the community. They are still, as James says, among you. And they should make requests for the elders of the church to be present with them. They should call for the elders of the church. They should call for the communal human presence offered by the church to engage in a healing touch for the one who suffers. And the elders are called upon to anoint with oil the one who is sick. Now, is this medicinal oil? I don't think it is. Is it magical oil? No, definitely not. Perhaps the oil is used to make something of a symbolic claim or a gesture, not unlike how we sometimes see oil functioning in the Old Testament scriptures. A symbolic claim that signifies that the one who is weak among us is sacred, is holy, belongs to us and to our community. And of course, the elders, when they apply this oil to the one who is sick, do so with, with, with physical touch. The touch, then, of the elders upon the sick signifies an ongoing embrace and inclusion within the people of God, as opposed to a rejection or social alienation that, or a desire to hide away the sick, lest we be reminded of our own sufferings. I grew up, as many of you probably know, in rural Iowa and was part of a very, very small community. And as a kid, I spent a lot of time in town, as we called it, with my grandparents after school. And many of the summers I spent with them as well. My grandma was a regular visitor of our, uh, the people who are in the nearby nursing home. And I often accompanied her to Sunset Knoll, our community nursing home. One of the things that I remember very clearly from those visits was touch, physical contact. I can remember clearly that my grandma and my mom would always reach out for both of the hands of those that they visited. And they would often hold their hands the entire time of their visit. And to be honest, I can remember that when I would accompany them, I would need to sort of brace myself. Remember, I was just an adolescent boy at this point. I needed to brace myself for the way in which I was going to get handled and touched as well. 
I never asked my grandma or my mom about why there was so much physical contact, so much physical touch taking place during those visits. But I think it was pretty evident that the aged, the suffering, the weak were longing for inclu inclusion, for embrace, for, recon for recognition and for friendship. And the mutual physical touch signified love and gentleness and recognition of one's humanity in their own experience of weakness and vulnerability. I wonder if James, student of the Jesus tradition that he was, I wonder if James himself learned something about this from Jesus. What I mean here is maybe James sees the church continuing the healing ministry of Jesus through practices whereby we as God's people continue to touch, to embrace, to protect the sick from the experiences of social isolation and alienation. Surely the gospel's incredible commitment to telling stories of Jesus' healing does more, not less, but does more than tell us about Jesus' divinity. One cannot read through the gospels without being struck by just how often Jesus engaged in healing through physical touch. I think of that episode of when Jesus encountered the woman plagued for 18 years with a condition that caused her back to be hunched over, to be bent at the waist, to walk around in a way that wouldn't allow her to straighten up. I think of the woman who for 12 years had the flow of blood that couldn't be stopped. Neither of these were death-dealing conditions that these women were experiencing. But both of these illnesses resulted in these women experiencing social alienation and exclusion. And Jesus' touch of these women, literally and physically as he makes contact with their sick and weak bodies, offers a sign that they are daughters of Abraham, that they belong to God's people, to God's family. The church continues the healing ministry of Jesus when we reject the logic of the world that says the weak and the sick should be isolated and removed from our midst. When we look for ways in our common life and our common body together to include, to welcome those who are sick and broken, and when we are quick to engage in appropriate forms of physical touch. Our prayers for the sick and the weak in tandem with our physical touch function as a sign of embrace and inclusion within our community for all who suffer. But secondly, a second reason we pray is we pray for the sick because we actually believe that God hears our prayers and that he will answer them. James has already let us know that he has a high view of prayer. Namely, he thinks that God answers the prayer of the righteous. He's told us already in chapter 1 that if we need wisdom, what should we do? We should ask God for wisdom and he'll give it to us freely. But he says the person who prays to God, this is chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, but doesn't expect God to actually answer his or her prayers, is a doubter, is one that is tossed to and fro by the sea and by the waves of the sea, and that person should not expect that God will answer his or her prayers if they pray but doubt the entire time. One of the blessings that I have here uh, as, as uh, one who works at Trinity is that I have a lot of wiser and older colleagues that I get to work with. Notice if you're offended by me saying older, I also included wiser there, so I mean it in the <laughs> kindest possible way. I actually do mean this though. There are multiple occasions where I've seen my senior colleagues respond to sickness, weakness, and death, as well as a commitment to intercessory prayer in ways that have challenged me and blessed me. I have one colleague, for example, who on more than a few occasions has said something along the lines of this to me. We should pray, Josh, but Josh, do you actually believe in prayer? Right? It's hard not to be a little bit offended. Of course I believe in prayer. Who, doesn't, right? Who here doesn't believe in prayer? But I know what he's talking about. Right? He says, I don't mean just going through the motions. I'm only, I mean, do you really believe that God listens to our prayers and will answer them? And I know exactly what he's talking about. Prayer isn't magic, but it shouldn't be something that we do apart from a deep, faith in God's ability and willingness to answer our prayers for healing for those who are sick and for those who suffer. We do this because we actually believe that God can and will answer our prayers. I imagine we're all struck by the way James puts this, right? I mean, James, verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, 
and the Lord will raise that one. James has stated this a little too strongly, hasn't he? Hasn't he? Now, if you're like me, maybe you're already thinking of ways that we need to qualify James' statements. You've seen the abuses, and I get that. Maybe you're already thinking of objections to what James has so plainly said. And that part probably comes naturally to us. After, and there are good reasons for this. We've seen already, even within James, the letter itself, that James has said God uses sufferings. They're not an evil in and of themselves, but he uses sufferings as a means of creating endurance and character. And this just goes straight through the New Testament and all of the scriptures. We can think of countless examples, right? Uh, think of Paul, for example, who prayed that God would remove his suffering. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. And we dare not pile burden upon burden for someone who is already suffering by telling them that if they only had more faith, then they would be healed. But I'm confident that you already understand this. And I don't want to, st- don't want to spend the bulk of our time qualifying everything James says when he says the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise that person up. If you're anything like me, it is a real challenge to live every aspect of your life, of my life, with the belief that God is real, he's powerful, and he's present in my ordinary and mundane life. God has indeed given us medical means to pursue healing, but my guess is, if you're like me, it's all too easy to have a much deeper and robust faith in medical technology than it is a belief in God's ability to answer and to respond to our prayers. The result is that prayer is often viewed as sort of a last resort. Nothing else works. All we can do now is pray. When we view this world as all there really is, or when we view this world even in our, none of us are going to say that, right? But when we view this world even in our implicit beliefs as though this is really all there is, To use the language that James gives to us in James 4, we act as though we are friends of the world and not friends of God. When we implicitly believe that the world is closed off from God's powerful, continued interaction to be with us. And as my colleague knows, this can all too easily affect our prayers. Does God really listen? Does he really respond? Does he really answer us when we cry out to him? Is he really active and present with us in our sufferings? and our trials, and our weaknesses. Prayer, I believe, is a gift given to us, at least in part, to show us that this world is not devoid of God and God's powerful presence. I have a friend in Christian ministry who, a few years ago, was diagnosed with the most serious form of cancer, and it was not caught quickly at all. My friend asked uh, his friends and his Christian colleagues and his church to engage in prayers to God for his healing, and that he would endure amidst the trial and weakness. He simultaneously said that he believed, he trusted that God would do what was right. And he embodied incredible Christian virtue amongst, uh, in the midst of his sufferings. I remember talking with one of my friends, and we both agreed. We said, uh, our friend is giving to us a remarkable example of how to suffer as a Christian and how to die as a Christian. But God answered our prayers. He didn't die. He did embody endurance and character and faith in his bodily sufferings and weaknesses. But God answered our prayers to extend his life, even in a situation that seemed to everyone to be hopeless, marked by certain death. And I imagine many of you have similar stories where you have seen Christ's resurrection power continue to be at work in the midst of your prayers for healing. Why does God do this? Why does he answer prayers for healing? It's pretty simple, I think. It's because he is good. He is the father of lights, as James says in chapter 1, who loves to give good gifts to his children. Once again, I can't help but think that James is thinking about some things he might have learned from his brother, who said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. If you then are evil know how to, and know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask from him? James shares with his brother a remarkable confidence that God delights to heal the sick, 
and to strengthen the weak when we pray. And if we do not share that same confidence, that would seem to be our problem and not that of James. Just as the physical touch with oil anointing enacted a tangible sign of inclusion within God's people, so does God answering our prayers for healing provide a tangible sign of God's goodness and presence among us, even when we are most vulnerable. But thirdly, and it's going to feel a little bit of a shift at this point, we pray to God for one another because we believe he will heal us from our sins. The primary focus of our text seems to me to be upon praying to God amidst our bodily sicknesses and weaknesses. But of course there is that bit then in verses 15 and 16 that says, if he has committed sins, the Lord will forgive him. So then confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you too may be healed. Furthermore, some of that language in verse 15 may be polyvalent. Verse 15, where it says he will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up, might be read on the one hand as the Lord will save the sick and raise him up by means of healing of the physical body. But it might also be read, and maybe both at the same time, even if such a one dies, the Lord will save him and will raise him up at the resurrection. Maybe James thought of this connection between physical healing of the body and salvation from Jesus, uh, and salvation as something again that he learned from Jesus. Who, to give just one example, when he saw the faith of the friends of the paralytic and the paralytic as well, engaged in bodily healing of the man, but also engaged in the fundamental need, uh, uh, responded to the fundamental need that the man had and healed him and forgave him of his sins. God cares indeed about our bodies, our health, our well-being. But if so, how much more has he committed himself to heal, to save, and to raise up these bodies, even in the face of death, if we endure? And so James counsels us to indeed pray to God for bodily healing. But almost without explicit cues, he moves into these exhortations to confess our sins to one another and to pray for forgiveness so that we may be healed from God. Presumably uh, uh, arguing that we would, in, praying that we would indeed endure amidst our trials, that we would not find ourselves to be friends of the world, and that we would receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love them. I'm supposed to stop at verse 18, but briefly, maybe this is why James ends his epistle in verses 19 through 20 with a promise for anyone who should restore someone who is sinning. He says in verse 19 that he, anyone who restores the person who is sinning from error, uh, let that person know in verse 20 that he will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. We do not just endure automatically apart from the means of grace that enable and empower us to continue in our faith in God amidst our trials and tests. I did my MDiv here about 15 years ago. And one of maybe the saddest parts of my life is that more than a few of my friends who sat together here in chapel with me, who took classes from the same professors that you're studying with, who went to the same churches that you're participating in and going to as well, many of them are no longer following the Lord. James invites us to confess our sins and to pray for one another so that no one among us may find our trials and our suffering so burdensome that we slip away, that we stray away from the truth and turn away from the Lord. I think James invites us to confess our sins to one another, lest our hearts become hardened to sin or to overburden uh, some shame of the sins that we may have committed, such that we are overwhelmed and we gradually move away from the Lord and from the kind of faith that can endure. James invites us to play an active role here in both confessing our sins and hearing them from one another, as well as praying for one another that God would restore our brother and sister. I can't help but again one more time think that James learned this from Jesus the Jesus who told his disciples to play an active role in watching out for our brothers and sisters who sin, to take care of the least of these and those little ones who may stray like sheep, they may lose their way, and to forgive them and to restore them and to include them back within the fold. So we have seen 
that God gives to his people the gift and the exhortation of prayer in response to, I think, what are two of the greatest threats to our faith, bodily illness and suffering, as well as Christian waywardness. We pray to God as a tangible sign of caring for the weak and the sick. We pray to God because we believe that he is good, he is powerful, and that he can answer our prayers for healing. And we pray to God because he be- we believe he will heal us and our fellow brothers and sisters of our sins when we confess them to one another. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would give to us the grace to endure. We pray, Father, that you would give to us through the power of prayer the ability to turn our hearts towards you, uh, to seek you in prayer as a gift that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.